Amen. If you've been with us for some time, you know that I speak much on the subject of fighting and enduring and winning and victory, right? And you know, I guess the reason for that is, is for the fact that there are much too many Christians that are defeated. Just too many defeated Christians. Which, from what I see and what I know, biblically makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. A defeated Christian, and it just it doesn't register. When you get in the Bible, that thing just doesn't work. You know why? Because the victory's won. The battle's the Lord's, right? And the promises are for you to lay hold on and claim as your own. That's why that thing doesn't make sense. But because there's so many defeated Christians, this is a topic that I like to address, and I think it can be a help to you if you'd have ears to hear and listen. You know, to believe the Bible is to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that fear and death, the grave, sin, hell, they're defeated. Got it? They're defeated in three short days. Three days, Jesus crushed the competition, didn't he? He put his head and he bruised the serpent's head and he crushed the competition in three days. So what seems to be the problem with so many Christians? Hanging their head, right? Just defeated. Woe is me. I can't ever seem to get the victory over this and I'm always defeated and every day's a struggle and every day's a battle. It's just a fight every day. I mean, I can hardly get to church. It's a fight just to get up in the morning. It's a fight just to read my Bible. It's a fight to pray. It's a fight to pass out. I mean, it's just such a struggle. Life's just so hard. Huh? <laughs> I thought the battle was won. Didn't Jesus conquer it all? Aren't you in Him? You know, James right now, he's losing the battle. No, he's not. <laughs> Say, what about losing the battle to cancer? Are you in Christ? You won. <laughs> you didn't lose anything. Listen, when you shed this body, you done lost the, the, the thing that's holding you down. Yes, sir. You lost the thing. You got, rid, you, you got rid finally of the thing that's keeping you from walking in victory. That stuff. James ain't losing. He's winning. He's a winner. Got that? Too many Christians just battling through life like every day is such a fight. It's such a struggle. Really? Fight the good fight of faith, right? Do you know what faith says? Faith says you already won. <laughs> That's what faith says. You believe that book, you believe the battle's over. You already won. The good fight of faith, faith says you won already. The battle's done. Now walk in victory. Yes, sir. Walk in newness of life. What seems to be the problem? All these giants, you know, all these giants in my life. I just can't seem to get the victory. Just always, the, the man's always beating me down, right? <laughs> Say, what about that old man and that new man? What about that old nature and that new nature? Well, let me ask you a question. Is the old man a defeated foe or is he not? <laughs> is, he, is he defeated or not? Well, that's what the Bible says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Well, he's dead. He's defeated. What well, seems to be the problem? I understand all this stuff. I've been living in this body and in this world long enough, and I've been in this Bible long enough. I understand the old man, and I understand that you can let him rise up. Sure, you can let him rise up. You can give that flesh control. 
I understand all that. I understand the flesh is weak and I understand uh, yield and yield not. I understand Romans chapter 7. What I don't understand is fighting when a battle is already won. That's what I don't get. Amen. Fighting a battle that's already won. <laughs> Why don't you look beyond the battle? Why can't you visualize and see through the battle and see the victory? Huh? If you can't see through it and see the victory that you've already won, the rest of your Christianity will just be a fight. Every day. That doesn't sound like the abundant life that Jesus promised us that we can live right now. That didn't sound like that. Am I making any sense? I just don't have time. <laughs> the Bible's filled. The Bible's filled with victories. It's filled with defeat, defeats. It's complete with battles that are won and battles that are lost. I mean, story after story after story after story. It'd be good for us to read those and take heed and apply them and to say, Lord, teach me something from this battle that they lost. Yeah. Lord, learn me. <laughs> teach me something from the battle that they won. Give me something. Give me some understanding from these battles that were won and lost that I can actually apply to my life. And they can manifest themselves and some fruit of the Word of God can be shown in my life that you receive the glory. Wouldn't that be good? Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed God's people lose every single time when they do it their way? You ever notice that? I'm going to do it my way. You know what that's called? The pride of life. Have at it. It's everywhere. Right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Have at it. It's my life. I'll live it my way. God will say, okay, have at it. Go for it. And then when you realize and you're defeated, right, and you're struggling through life, and every day's a fight, and then you say, Lord, help me. And the Lord says, sorry, you made the bed. Now sleep in it. God don't work that way. Reaping and sowing. You're better off just living for God. You're, just, you're better off just fighting that battle along with Him. Say, Lord, this is a fight, but I know you're with me, and I know that the victory is on the other side, so I'll look through the battle and I'll see the victory. It's already defeated. Is death already defeated? Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. Is sin defeated? Is hell defeated? Fear is defeated. There's no fear in love. Amen? What a blessing. You know what? For God's people, it's a win-win-win. Or should I say a one-one-one? Yeah. You know Donald Trump's slogan, you're going to win so much, you're going to get sick of winning, win-win-win-win. You heard him say that before. Win. We ought to take that. I'm going to take that for myself. I'm just going to win so much, but I'm not going to get sick of winning. Because <laughs> I've already won. And I won. And I won. And I won that. And I won that. All these things that are dragging everybody down, that are keeping everybody down, I'm already victorious over those things. I've already won. Amen. Boy, you walk on cloud nine. You keep that in your mind. So I want to give you an example here. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to give you an example from the Bible of this very thing from a very familiar story. Okay? 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now what you have in 1 Samuel chapter 17 is David's defeat of Goliath. You know what that was? That was a win-win. That was that winner-winner chicken dinner thing, amen? That was a win-win-win. The giant fell, the Philistines fled, and God received the glory. Well, that's a win-win-win, ain't it? Good story. Well, let me ask you a question. How did he win? What did he do to secure the victory? What did he do? 
Well, you could say he took that sling. Did he take the sling? Sure, he took the sling. He took the sling, he took the rock, and he spun that thing around and knocked his lights out. One shot. Because that's all it takes with God. Just one shot. Amen? That's what he did, right? And he won the victory. I got a question. I got to thinking about this when I was studying this. Do you suppose this was the first time that David used the sling? Like, what is this thing? Well, I'll just try this out. I saw somebody else do this, you know. Or do you suppose he was well-trained and well-versed and well-accomplished in the use of his weapon? You know why so many Christians are defeated? They can't seem to get the victory? You're not well-versed and you're not well accomplished, and you're not well trained with the weapon, that'll keep you down. That'll keep you defeated, won't it? Sure, David trusted the Lord, but he also trusted and had confidence in the weapon that God gave him. It's just something to keep in mind. Now, I'm sure everyone here could tell me something about this story. I mean, who doesn't know about David and Goliath? My goodness. You could tell me something about how he defeated the enemy, and it's all good things, and it's all things we can learn from. But I got to thinking this. I wonder if you ever stop to think about the things he did not do, the things he didn't do, and how they played a part in the defeat of such a daunting foe. The things he didn't do. You know what you need to do? You need to study your enemy. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 4. Wouldn't that be a good thing to study your enemy? Here we have in 1 Samuel chapter 17, the armies of Israel and the Philistines have gathered themselves for war. And the Philistines, guy, they have a secret weapon. He's big. He's a big guy. Amen? Some say seven to nine foot tall. I don't know for sure. He's big. He's big and he is intimidating. And there's not one person in all of Saul's army that will contend against him. He must have been, that must have been a sight. Let's study our enemy. And there went out in verse four, a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. Now what all that means I have have no idea. Amen. <laughs> I don't know how big it was or how much it weighed. Maybe you can figure it out. I'm just going to just read it and just believe it. That thing was big. His spear was big. His armor was big. He was big. His helmet was big. This is a big dude. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I suppose he would have ruled the UFC. Right? He'd have done pretty good in WWF, right? I look, at, I look at Goliath here in this story as a representation of life's many difficulties, unpredictabilities, and impossibilities. You know, on the surface, from a logical human perspective with worldly wisdom, this war is over. Mm -hmm. Israel does not stand a chance. If you read the rest of this story, 40 days in a row, Goliath went out, right? And he mocked and he cursed and he defied the armies of Israel and not one soldier would come out to contend with him, not one, for 40 days in a row. Picture that, on the battlefield, sending out Goliath 40 days in a row. And the armies of Israel, with God behind them, not one man would step up. Boy, the laborers are few, aren't they? That's where we're at today. 
Listen, if you live defeated and you're just conquered and you're just fighting and struggling every day, you won't have time to step out by faith. You're too busy with yourself. You're too busy in your own problems. You're too busy just trying to get through life. People, we're not, trying to, we're not supposed to be trying to get through life. We're to be living. But that's where they're at, isn't it? God's army is for fear. They're just a, before the battle even begun. What they saw, what they heard, before it even begun, they're defeated. Does that register anywhere with you? You ever been through that? Like God calls you, say, step out, amen? Step out. By faith, step out. And all of a sudden, guess what happens in your brain? Yeah, a million excuses. And that armies of Israel, they had a million excuses why they couldn't. But one man stepped out. Look at verse 8. Look at the enemy. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then, we'll be, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed. And greatly afraid. Can I ask you a question? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, that's an easy decision. You know why it's an easy decision? Because the Lord's with me and the battle's already won. I'm going to fight on the winning side. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Who would, who would, I want to fight on the losing side. I just want to lose every time. I want to be on your team. You always lose. Huh? <laughs> Choose you this day whom you will serve. You know what you can do? You can either serve life and just let, let life just lead the way. Or life can serve you and say, you know what, life, this is what you're going to do, and this is what I'm going to do with this life, and I'm going to serve God because the victory is won and it's already over. And all this stuff that has everyone oppressed and defeated, fighting and fighting and fighting, that stuff's already won. I'm already victorious over it. I see through the battle and I see the victory. I'm going to walk with you. And life, you're going to do what I tell you to do. Amen. I want you to notice something here. Notice something here. Goliath's asking for a fight, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Think about this. That's what, that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to engage him. You see, he gets in a blow, and then you get in a blow, and then he gets in a blow, and then you get in a blow, and you just do that all the rest of your life, and you never get nowhere. You ever read about the whole armor of God? Put on the shield of faith that you may be able to stand against all the wiles of the devil. He don't get in any blows, amen? I mean, the fight between David and Goliath, was that a fight? Was that a fight? That pretty one-sided, wasn't it? How many blows did Goliath get in on David? That's a big zero. One rock, one sling, one God, victory's defeated, right? It's over. But see, he wants you to, he wants you to engage. Don't engage. Yeah. Don't engage. Stand by faith in the promises of God's word. Lay hold on those things and look through the battle. Look past the giant and know he's defeated. This thing's over before it even starts. Israel was on the other side. They saw, they, they saw the giant. They heard his words. They saw the weaponry. And they said, the battle's over. We can't win this. Right. But yet one little guy, one young lad stood up. That's amazing. What a story, man. 
I love verse 12. Just the first two words. It just says, now David. <laughs> it's like all the armies of Israel are dismayed. They're greatly afraid. And now David. <laughs> Why don't you be that now David? Amen? How could it be that David saw the exact same thing? He heard the same thing. He saw the same thing. But he visualized something much different than all the armies of Israel. How could it be? So what did David not do? Look at verse 16. That's what we're looking at. Not so much what he did, but what he didn't do to win the victory. Verse 16, and the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephith of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses. <laughs> what a story, man. <laughs> this thing just blows me away and carry ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousands, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Answer me this. What was it that brought David to the battlefield? What was it that provided the opportunity, right, to defeat the giant and win the victory. What was it? What was it that made a way for him to even leave the, the few sheep that he had and go to the battlefield? Let me tell you, 10 cheese sandwiches. 10 cheese sandwiches. You know, God doesn't ask much of you. He really doesn't. But you better pay attention to those little things. You know, if you're faithful to the little things, a whole new thing might open up to you. All new opportunities. Some of you might have it in your mind that one day, you know what, I'd like to get in the pulpit and I'd like to preach and I'd like to get in the ministry. You better pay attention to those 10 cheese sandwiches and just do what you're told in the little things. Listen, when that, I don't, you know, I don't talk about money a lot. When that plate comes around, that's just such a little thing. <laughs> Mike, why are you making a big thing out of something that's little? When you get up and God sits and tugs on your heart and says, you need to read that Bible today, is that a big thing? No. Is taking 10 cheese sandwiches down to the battle, is that a big thing? Is he asking that much of David? But look at what it opened up to him. The possibilities, the opportunities now. Not without the 10 cheese sandwiches. Amen? I want you to notice one thing that he didn't do. We know what he did do. He obeyed his father. Right? That's right. His father said, take that cheese, take that bread, take that corn, run down there to the battlefield and, and, and feed them folks, feed them soldiers, feed your brother, see how they're doing. We know what he did do, but what did he do? What didn't he do? You know what he didn't do? I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't complain. Uh-oh, here we go. American, most complaining people on planet Earth, they have the most, complain the most. You know it's true. I'm very well acquainted with the human nature. He could have complained. Couldn't he have? But he didn't. The Bible says, do all things without murmurings. Philippians 2 and verse 14. So David's like, he, he's presented with this task from his father. So let me get this straight, Dad. Let me get this straight, Pops. You want me to take a bushel of corn, ten cheeses, ten loaves of bread, and you want me to run to the battlefield? Load it down with all this stuff. You want me to run? Can't we call an Uber driver or something? <laughs> Can't you get me a wagon? Can't you get me a horse? You want me to run? Yeah, I want you to run. You know why? Because that's what this race is. Hey, Christian, we're not coasting through life. We're not looking for a ride. We're not trying to hitchhike. You're supposed to be running. 
And God will burden you down and He'll give you some burdens. He'll put a load on you, but it'll be light when you're walking with Jesus. He didn't complain though, did he? I mean, come on. If you look at verse 15, you've been feeding the sheep all day. I mean, come on, Dad, I've been feeding your sheep and now you want me to run five miles to the battlefield? Can't you get Ozem or Elihum or one of my brethren? I mean, they're just playing video games. They ain't doing nothing. Go get them to do it. I'm tending the sheep. No, I want you. I want you. Passing the buck, right? Yes. I hear it all the time. <laughs> do the dishes. Can't you get... I mean, think about the little things, being faithful. Don't forget about the little things. All right, Dad, I'll do it. When do you want me to go? Look at verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning. In the morning? <laughs> Come on. You know I sleep in. In the morning? <laughs> you know I'm not a morning person. I'm just scratching the surface. He probably couldn't complain about a bunch of stuff, but he didn't. Yeah. But he didn't. Funny how Christians complain about the little things. The Lord doesn't ask you to do much, and it's not very difficult what He's asking you to do. It's just by faith. Overcome those fears. Look through the battle. Look through the fear. It's conquered. It's beaten. It's, it, it's already won. Why are you so scared? That thing's beaten. It's vic Jesus arose victorious. He arose bodily, and then He ascended too. And then He said, where I'll be, you'll be also. Amen? Giants. He said, where I'll be, you'll be also. Didn't the giant just fall right there? Bam. <laughs> I'm going to heaven. Yep, that's it. What is this giant? I'm looking right through him. Yep. He's defeated. That's what David was able to do. You say, what didn't he do? Well, he didn't complain, did he? You know what else he didn't do? He didn't listen to the doubters. He didn't listen to the doubters. You get on fire for God, guess what will come out of the woodwork, man? <laughs> doubters! You know, the strongest doubter, the most influential doubter is probably right there between your, between your ears. You read, you read about his doubters. You know the two doubters we found in this chapter that doubted him are two people that he looked up to. They're two men that normally, right, normally you would pay attention to. You know who it was? Well, look at verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, that's his oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? You know what David's saying in his heart? I didn't come down here to see no battle. I come down here to win. <laughs> I came down here to beat that giant that all of you are so dismayed and so discouraged about and you, you won't even step out. And here's his oldest brother, the one that I'm, I'm sure he looks up to, right? And the one that normally he would listen to that's doubting him. He's saying, David, you're just a little shepherd boy. Get back to your sheep. You ain't nobody. You ain't nothing. You can't do that. David said, I see a cause and the cause allows me to see through the battle and see the victory because there's a cause. Do we have a cause? So why is it so hard for Christians to get on fire for God and walk with God and live by faith and step out by faith? Why is it so difficult in your brain? That's where your doubter's at. It's right there. Amen. And who was his other doubter? Look at verse 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he made, and he a man of war from his youth. Boy, his brother and the king. And he didn't listen to either one of them, did he? You know why? Is there not a cause? He didn't hear them, he heard the cause. He wasn't influenced by them. He was influenced by the cause. 
and he saw through the battle, and he saw beyond the giant and saw the victory. Last thing, David did not see the impossibility, but the possibility. Right? The rest of the armies of Israel saw the impossibility. Could it be? In every so-called impossibility, there is a possibility. You know, the world, they look out into their future and they see death and they see an impossible, an impossible thing to overcome. Don't they? That's a very daunting thought. The thought of the fact of the impossibility of death. Well, not to me. You suppose that in every impossibility or so-called impossibility, there's a possibility. Yeah, because with him, all things are possible. All things are possible. thank you, Corey. And with him, you can do all things, all things through Christ. I suppose way, way, way back, even the thought of pastoring a church is like, <laughs> you're kidding me, right? Even the thought of knocking a door, passing out a track, witnessing, even the thought of those things was like, not just telling myself that, but in that impossibility, guess what? There was a possibility. See, I like walking in those possibilities, not in them impossibilities. That was David. Here, one verse. Look at it. Verse 46. Verse 46, the scene here, the setting is David now has stepped out. And he's face to face. I don't know how tall David was. Five foot six, five foot seven, five foot eight, six foot. I don't know. But he's standing before a mountain of a man. And with boldness, this is what he says to this giant. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will, no doubt, I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Ready for the possibility? He saw through the giant, he saw through the battle, and he saw the possibility. You want to see the possibility? That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. <laughs> to think that God could use me to make himself known in all the earth. Some of you historian buffs, what's the shot that was heard around the world? What's the shot heard around the world? It's not the Revolutionary War or something like that, the first shot? No, it's right here. That's the shot heard around the world. The story of David and Goliath, that thing has reached every culture, every country. And that phrase is still used to this day to describe an underdog or someone that doesn't stand a chance. Someone that is going against all odds is a David and Goliath. That's the analogy that is still used to this day. One shot heard round the world. The possibility for every Christian, if you would be able to look through the battle and through the giant and see the victory that's already won. Mm -hmm. I just picture David when, 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 the, when Goliath is defying the armies of Israel, he's just there with a big smile on his face, shaking his head. You don't even know, buddy. You're already defeated. This thing's already over. Talk all you want, right? Intimidate all you want. You have no idea. I'm looking, I'm looking through you, and I see that you're, you're fallen. I'm victorious. You're defeated already. Amen. 
the possibility is that all the world will know that there's a God. Can God use you to show the world that there's a God? Can He? Well, and He does, doesn't He? What if you're, oh man, oh, life, oh, I just can't do it anymore. I'm not able, I can't do it. Oh my goodness, look at this giant, oh man. Just run to the world, right? You think the world's going to stand up and say, man, we want their God. <laughs> oh, we want what they got. No wonder after this day, all of Israel took notice of this young man. And he became their king. Yes, he did. And they followed him. Yep. He became the king that all the other kings compared themselves to. He became the king that on his throne Jesus Christ will sit one day. <laughs> he became the king, David, a man after God's own heart. And I tell you what, God's heart for you is not to walk defeated. God's heart for you is not to fight every day is just such a battle and such a fight. Oh my goodness, how am I going to do it? It's already won. <laughs> that thing you're fighting with? Why? Why, why even let him get a blow in, right? That's what the Satan wants. He wants you to get in this entangled with him and fight with him. And back and forth, this back and forth stuff. That's what's going on with a lot of Bible believers right now, just fighting. <laughs> Forget about it. Amen? It's fight, fight, fight. That's of the devil, Amen? It's over. The victory, the victory is yours. Go and walk in it. Amen. He'd be walking on cloud nine. That'd be some light steps, won't it? Just walking in victory like. Like here comes the next obstacle. I don't even see it. It's already defeated. So what is it? I don't know what's in your heart. What is it that you're just battling with every day? I can tell you this. There's a promise in there that you haven't laid hold on. Amen. There's something in there that has not got a hold of you. The last thing Satan wants is for these precious promises to get a hold of you. That's the last thing he wants. You know how he keeps you from that? He keeps you fighting with him. Or he keeps you fighting in this life. Just fight, fight, fight. You got some precious promises, don't you? Amen. Can I read you one verse? Listen. Just listen. 2 Peter 1.4 Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Sounds like we won. <laughs> Sounds like we won. I've already escaped it. Listen, if, you, if you've escaped something, don't go back. Don't entangle yourself with that thing again. That's all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all the corruption in this world. At, at the foundation of that is lust. And by this divine nature that you have in Christ, in you, a new creature in Christ Jesus, you've escaped. Amen. You know how big uh, the prisoners that escape prison, they're just like <laughs> smiling ear to ear yeah, until they get caught. You've escaped. You're out of it, amen? Where are you at? What is it? What besetting sin just keeps dragging you down, dragging you back, dragging you down? Fight, 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 fight. You've not laid hold on something. There's something in that book, a promise, that you have not made your own and say, you know what, that's mine, and the battle's, the, the battle's over. 
It's already won. That just reminded me. I have some quotes in here. I got I to read this quote to you. It says this, don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell the storm how big your God is. Amen. Isn't that a good one? You can make a million arguments in your own mind, but a single truth spoils all the arguments. How about that one? David was not moved by what he heard or what he saw or what he felt. He was moved by what he believed. That'll help you. All right, let's pray. Father God, we... Lord, we're needy people. And Lord, we need to stay humble. And we need to always know that uh, you're God and we're just your children. And Lord, we serve a purpose here. That's to please you. And I know that without faith, it's impossible to please you. So, Lord, may we be people of faith, willing, Lord, to look through the, the battle and look through the storm and look through the giants, Lord, and see the victory and just to walk through it. And I know you're with us, Lord, and you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us, Lord, and your co laborers with us and all those wonderful things. Help us, Lord God, to be your people that the world might see you, that the world might know that there's a God in Sioux City, that the world might know there's a God around this world through these missionaries that we support. This world's forgotten about you. Lord, they don't like to retain God in their knowledge. They don't like to retain you in their knowledge. Lord, may we be people that continually put God back in the minds and the hearts of these people. That they might know, Lord, and understand what we know, that there's hope. Lord, that death is not the end, it's just the beginning. That they can get victory over addictions, over sin, over fear, over whatever it is, Lord, you've already conquered them all. And Lord, may we be people that walk in those precious promises, Lord, laying hold on them with joy in our heart, Lord, because of what you've done for us. Help us not to get entangled with all that is in this world, the affairs of this life, but to set our affections on things above. Lord, one day we'll stand before you and see you face to face. I'm looking forward to that day, Lord. And help us to do what, we, or what you've called us to do, Lord, that at the judgment seat of Christ, Lord God, that we'll be rewarded. And Lord, I don't care how many crowns you give me, I'm giving them back to you because you're worthy. David's God was worthy of him risking his life and stepping out by faith because he had already won the victory. He knew it was over before it even started. Help us to be more than conquerors like your Bible says. Lord, help us to walk by faith and live by faith and to love you and to serve you. And Lord, those things, Lord, that hinder us, that keep us down, that beset us, Lord, I pray that, Lord, we'd claim the Word of God and the promises and lay hold on those. And I know that through your Word, Lord, the battle's over. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Or